guys, how's it going? Well, it turns out I did survive that bachelor party. The crappy truck I showed you in that video made it part of the way into the woods and uh, broke down about a quarter of the way in. Uh, we camped for a night, that was nice, and then there was a wildfire notice, so we had to evacuate. Got in the truck, um, started driving out, and didn't the truck break down within a stone's throw of the actual fire? Yeah, let's get the fuck out of here. So we ended up getting towed out by our buddies using a, using a strap. But you know, coming so close to death made me really start to think, what have I not done in my life that I've always wanted to do? And that is when I got to thinking, <sighs> educational video about pulleys and belts. Before I get started with the really exciting stuff, I just wanted to update you on my other projects. Eric managed to finish the firmware for the turrets for the CNC lathe, and those are working great. Masso is actually including some small changes to their software in their next release that'll make my turrets work on Masso, which I think is pretty amazing of them. I'm moving along well with the 3D printer also. I didn't order some parts as early as I should have, so they're not arriving until Monday, so I can't really do the update for it yet. But all in all, it's looking pretty good. So even though I feel like I've gotten a lot done in the past two weeks, I don't have a whole lot of footage to show for it, because a lot of it's been like wiring and ordering parts and things like that. I still wanted to make a video for this weekend, and I wanted to do something useful, so I thought I would share this. I'm still not sure about this format and the whole PowerPoint presentation thing, but I'd love to get some feedback on what you think would make it more engaging. I'm not above using sock puppets if needed. Welcome to another HLAPS 1990 PowerPoint presentation. First, I just wanted to go over uh, quickly a few things that I've learned about pulleys and belts recently that have actually made everything a whole lot easier, especially being sort of a home shop kind of guy. Um, you have two best friends. Your first one is the multi-rib V-belt, which I've recently discovered and I absolutely love. So rather than going through all the effort of setting up your compound slide on a lathe and, and cutting the, uh, the angles to make a single groove V-belt, you can actually use a form cutter and you can cut a multi-rib V-belt. So these guys transmit a lot of power. They run really high or really low speeds. They're super quiet. They also bend a lot, so they have a much smaller cross-section, so you can really bend them around corners and things. They are a little more expensive and harder to find, although McMaster Car does carry them. And more ribs can be added to add more power. So I use a six-groove multi-rib V-belt on my lathe, uh, but they go up to 30 grooves, I think, which would probably look ridiculous, but I'm sure transmits an awful lot of power. So I've posted the profiles here. I got these from torquetrends.com. I used the J section for my lathe. It's working really well. The little meh comment is actually referencing the form cutter that I ground. I ground it to a sharp point so it doesn't cut a radius at the bottom. That's going to be a little bit of a stress riser, but because it's a fairly low force application, I think it'll be okay. More importantly, that kind of deviation from the profile actually doesn't affect the performance. So you can imagine the belt itself actually has a profile that mates with the, the profile shown for the pulleys here. And so the, the peaks of the belt aren't ever actually going to get to the valleys of the pulley. So if I cut a little bit too deep, like I've shown, it's actually okay. The next uh, little trick I've discovered is HTD timing pulleys. HTD timing pulleys stand for high torque drive timing pulleys. They transmit a lot of power, they can run at very high or very low speeds, and they can actually be profiled very easily on a milling machine. So a lot of the other timing pulley profiles have these really intricate profiles and you'd need like a like a 30 second end mill to, to get the profile correctly. And then of course you can't go very deep if you're profiling it. So you can actually approximate an HTD timing pulley just by drilling a bunch of holes around the periphery and then just by interpolating a circle that connects them. Um, That'll leave you a sharp corner, so you actually have to clean the corners up with a file. But it actually does a pretty good job. I've done it for a few projects now, and it worked great. There's a, a YouTube video that I'll, that I'll try to remember to reference in the description that shows it being done. Uh, disadvantages is that they're a little bit loud, just like all timing pulleys. And they do have more backlash than the GT2. So it might not make sense to use them for high precision motion control. Nevertheless, it was very useful to, to know that you can do that. So the next thing is something I'm really, I'm really nerding out on a bit here is the idea of a capstan drive. So rather than having a belt that fits into a taper on a pulley, you actually just take like a string and you wrap it around the cylinder 
and the number of times you wrap it around exponentially increases how much force it can hold before the cord will slip. It's a really interesting principle, so if you were prototyping something and you didn't have pulleys or a belt, you could conceivably make a system just using the capstan equation like this. So I've shown some examples here for how I've seen it used before, like power transmission and uh, sort of a reduction system similar to using pulleys. And uh, if you've ever looked underneath a manual surface grinder, there's actually a capstan with a steel strip that wraps around it once between the two sides of the x-axis. So if you can imagine in the picture, turning that wheel will make the table go back and forth. And I thought that was kind of cool. So there are some definite advantages to capstans. They're really inexpensive. If you look at the newer materials coming out now for ropes, like Dyneema, Kevlar, Technora, they have incredibly low stretch, like less stretch than steel does. And they're also very strong. So you could easily incorporate something like that into a capstan drive, I think. Capstan drives are also capable of very high speeds and relatively high forces. Basically, the limiting factor on the force is the tensile strength of the cord you're using. And they're also capable of a very high accuracy, if done correctly. So if you maintain the tension properly, there won't be any slipping. And then the accuracy is actually quite high. There are some disadvantages, like if you don't tension it properly, it will slip. They can also bind as the lines cross each other. And the lines can walk along the capstan, so you have to watch for that. So in this presentation, I wanted to sort of cover a very basic situation. You have two shafts, you know the distance apart, like uh, this is the situation I was in with my lathe, for example, and you want to know what, what kind of sort of pulley system you can get away with. One shaft is going to be the motor shaft, so for the motor you know the torque and you know the speed, those are both provided by the manufacturer. There's going to be continuous values and peak values, you're going to want to use peak values. Uh, that just ensures that you're sort of on the safe side of things. And for the other shaft, you're going to know the load. So you either know what speed you want it to move at, or you know what torque you want it to rotate with. Uh, one is normally more important than the other. So for my lathe, I said, at least for the first uh, pulley, I knew I had a 3000 RPM motor. Uh, I knew I wanted a 7000 RPM output, and I didn't really care what the torque was. So the first thing you're going to want to consider is, are belts and pulleys really the right choice? Belts are especially good for long or variable distances to transmit the power. Moderate power, so we'll say less than 75 horsepower for some of the bigger V-belts. Uh, you wouldn't want to put this sort of in line with the, the drivetrain of, say, your crappy truck in the middle of a forest fire. Uh, and moderate speeds too. So I said 8,000 RPM. Really, they can go up to sort of 10 or 12,000 RPM, depending on the belt. One thing I like about them is that they're low cost. So belts and pulleys are pretty cheap and pulleys are fairly easy to make. They're also reasonably high precision if you're using like a timing belt. So uh, the GT series especially, GT2, GT3, GT5 are all pretty accurate. And typically they are fairly low noise. So timing belts will make a buzz when they're running at high speed, but V belts are actually quite quiet compared to chains or gears or anything like that. So there's a few applications where you want to avoid belts. If you're aiming for a really large reduction, uh, unless you're using multiple stages, belts might not be the right choice. Uh, and even with multiple stages, if you end up with too much torque on the other side, belts may not be able to handle it. Uh, if you have an application that can backdrive. So a backdrivable application is basically an application where you can push on the output and turn the input. So live tooling on my lathe, for example, I wasn't actually able to do that because my spindle would have needed a break. If I were to push on the spindle, I could actually probably overcome the motor. Uh, another bad application would be a hostile environment. So if you're looking at really high temperatures or if you're in a vacuum or underwater, you're going to want to avoid pulleys. Pulleys work by harnessing the friction between the pulley and the belt. So if you're in a... a a high lubricity environment if you're in say cutting fluid flying everywhere that could really affect the performance of the belt quite a bit and also if you're in a very dirty environment that'll wear down the belt quite a bit belts can be very precise but they're not the highest precision system out there so if you need really really high precision uh, even timing belts probably aren't the right way to go and finally if you're looking for a high rigidity system even if you're not back driving the system, you may still be able to stretch the belt a little bit. So you'll always have a little bit of wiggle in, in the power transmission system. Uh, there's a couple other things to consider too. So 
Belts will stretch over time. You know, as you get older, your metabolism slows down. Normal usage, belts will start stretching. Um, the other thing is long, unsupported sections of belt will slap around. Uh, it depends on the frequency. It's, it's a harmonic thing. But basically, if it's a really long, unsupported section, there will be a magical frequency where it flaps around like crazy and it's kind of dangerous. And finally, belts can be fairly dangerous themselves. You should always have guards around them. And sometimes when they fail, they, they fling off the pulley quite energetically. So you want to be careful about that. So once you've decided that belts are the way to go, you're going to want to calculate the amount of power you need. If you're designing something with a known motor power like I was for my lathe, I knew it was about a horsepower. It was easy. It was just, okay, one horsepower. I need a belt that can handle one horsepower. If you're calculating this for like a servo or a stepper motor where they often won't give you the power, you have to calculate it yourself. Uh, and that's just torque in inch pounds times the speed in RPM divided by 63,025, which is some ridiculous unit conversion number. So once you have the power, you have to calculate the service factor. Basically, the service factor is a fudge factor. Um, like with a lot of mechanical calculations, there's a lot of stuff that you can't predict. So over time, people add in these fudge factors and they sort of experimentally calculate what they are. I like to simplify this factor just using a service factor of two. And then you're going to want to multiply your service factor by the power to get what's called your design power. Design power is the power that you're designing for. So as you can see, if I have a one horsepower motor, multiply it by a service factor of two, I'm gonna design everything as if it were a two horsepower system. Reduction is basically just how much speed or torque you want to change between the pulley shafts. For the output shaft, you'll either need a certain speed or you'll need a certain torque. So in my lathe example, I wanted 7,000 RPM. So I needed that and I didn't care as much what the torque was. If you find yourself needing more torque and more speed, you need a different motor. So belt size is the next thing. Uh, belt suppliers will often provide a graph and that graph's gonna have the horsepower and the belt speed on it. And that'll correspond to different regions on the graph, which are different belt sizes you can use. So if we were doing an example where we know the motor shaft is moving at 1800 RPM and it's a 10 horsepower motor, we look at this super ugly graph. We go to 20 horsepower because remember it's our safety factor of two times 10. And then we're going to go to 1800 RPM, which puts us right there. And then you can see we're in the uh, A, AX region. So this is a this graph is from Gates, and they have A size is what I'm used to thinking of, but they also have AX, which I think is a narrow one. Uh, it's basically a belt profile A. So there's some pretty important notes to take away. There's different belt sizes and names. So there's A, B, C, D, and E for V belts, and there's H, J, K. K, L, M for multi-rib belts. And the other thing, if you look at the previous slide, is that belts are really strong. So on this graph, say, you can see anything sort of above, I don't know, a thousand RPM, you can pretty much go up to 10 horsepower with that, with the smallest size belt. And I find that pretty reassuring, because a lot of the stuff that at least I do is going to be fractional horsepower, at least under five horsepower. And it's good to know that sort of the smallest belt can really handle that. Now that we know what kind of belt we're going to be using, we're going to calculate the small pulley diameter. It turns out that V-belts like to move at 4,000 feet per minute. That is, it's like the sweet spot that you use for your calculations. Uh, you can do 1,000 to 5,000, but anything outside that range, and you'll start getting weird vibrations, or if you're moving too fast, you risk breaking the belt. Timing belts can usually move between five and 10,000 feet per minute, depending on the size. Typically, the smaller the belt, the faster it can move. So we can basically use this 4,000 number to size the small pulley. So we're gonna multiply 12 by 4,000 feet per minute divided by pi times the speed in RPM. The 12 just converts it to inches. For the large pulley diameter, we're gonna multiply the small pulley diameter by the reduction. You can calculate your belt length using this equation here. Um, it's not pleasant, but I would highly recommend using an online calculator. I've got some in the description that are pretty good. And that should be all you need to order the pulleys and the belts. Uh, there's another situation that people like you and I probably find ourselves in where we scrounge the pulleys and the belts. We know what the length of the belt is. We know how big the pulleys are. And now we're going to design around that. So we have to calculate the center distance. The equation for that is absolutely heinous and I didn't even want to type it. 
but the center distance calculator that I included in the description should be able to do that for you. Well, that's about it for this video. Um, it's a, sort of a brief overview of designing a drive pulley system. There's a lot of other stuff I could cover too. There's all kinds of motion control applications for pulleys, like the timing pulleys on my 3D printer, for example. And there's other caps and stuff I would love to cover too. That's something I'd love to learn more about. Um, and there's sort of machining aspects to pulleys too I could try to have a look at. Anyways, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And uh, I'd love to hear in the comments what you think about this whole instructional kind of video. If I go too into detail, not into detail enough, if there's topics you want to hear about, I'll see you next time. Cheers!